Welcome to another round of Prem and Proper here at SDH. Welcome back to match week early 20s. Depending on which team is the one that you follow, we'll go back over the last seven days or so and get you ready for the weekend. A lot of news. We have a lot of sound from our friends at Sky that have gone through the week, and a lot of it centers around Manchester City. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but let's take you over the scores over the last seven days and get you ready for the next little while. Going back to February 3rd, Chelsea and Fulham goalless draw. That happened at a plus 313. Early match on Saturday morning, Everton, Sean Dyche taking over. They get the win at a plus 692 over Arsenal by the score of 1-0. to nil. Wolves and Liverpool. Wolves, another shock win at almost a plus 300, depending on which set of juice boxes you stare at. Liverpool, two goals given up in a hurry, one of them an own goal. Wolves score three, Julian Lopetegui, three key points, and they get the win in one of the 10 o'clock matches on Saturday. Manchester United over Crystal Palace at a minus 263. That one was a 2-1 final. Brighton with a goal latest of late, 90-plus at the death, basically. Brighton at a minus 256 gets full points at the Amex against Bournemouth. Brentford. Three on the board against Southampton at a minus 133. They walk away with full points. Leicester in an absolutely crazy match. Six-goal thriller, 4-2 win for Leicester at Villa Park at a plus 261. Newcastle and West Ham. West Ham kind of just stymies and slows everything down for a 1-1 draw at a plus 286. Two matches on your Sunday. Nottingham over Leeds, 1-0 at a plus 179 at City Ground. That would end up being the last match for Jesse Marsh as head coach and manager of uh, Leeds United. So Nottingham Forest, big three points there. Not, and uh, Spurs, a 1-0 win over Manchester City, shocking the citizens who had a chance to close the gap between themselves and Arsenal. Doesn't happen. Spurs get the win at a plus 301, the one goal on the board by Harry Kane. Also, uh, on your Wednesday, Manchester United in Leeds, a 2-2 draw. That one happened at a plus 355. So that sets up how uh, your table looks as we head into the weekend. And we have our three distinct groups, and we'll kind of let you see how things are laid out. 20 matches played Arsenal's on top, match in hand over Manchester City, 50 points to 45. Manchester City really could have used the win against Spurs, but it did not happen. Manchester United is third, 22 matches played, and 43 points. Newcastle in fourth. They are in a European football position, having drawn for their last five, 10-10, and they've only lost once in their 21 matches this year, but they're at 40 points. Spurs right now at 39. They have won two in a row, and they are in the Europa League spot. Now, group number two. Starts with Brighton at 34 points. They've won three of their last four unbeaten in their last four under Roberto De Zerbi. They're sixth. Brentford, fantastic season so far. Unbeaten in their last five. They've won four, and they are seventh at 33. Fulham has only won, has only one point in their last three matches. They're at 32 points in eighth. Chelsea and Liverpool, 30 points and 29 points, respectively ninth and tenth. Villa at 28 points. They have played 21 matches. They are in 11th. And we'll go ahead and include Crystal Palace and Nottingham Forest in group number two, although there is a bit of distance. 24 points each. Palace a hit on goal difference, minus 10 to minus 18. Identical records. Goal difference is the difference between Palace and Forest right now at 12th and 13th. So here's group number three. And you have six points separating seven teams. Leicester. 21 points, four points in their last two matches. They've lost 12 matches this year. They've only won six. They're at 21 points. Wolves, with their win, they've won two of three under Lopetegui. 20 points. They've only scored 15 goals this year. Leeds, 19 points, 21 matches played. They are now officially uh, four wins, seven, seven draws, 10 losses, 19 points. West Ham is... At uh, 5, 4, and 12, leads ahead of West Ham right now on goals scored. Minus 8 to minus 8 in goal difference. Leeds has scored 10 more goals than West Ham. So West Ham is that one team right out of the relegation fight. But Everton's at 18 points. Bournemouth's at 17 points. They've lost 4 of 5 under Gary O'Neill. 
and Southampton looking adrift right now. 17 goals scored, 21 matches, and a goal difference of minus 21 at 15 points. They have won, have only won once in their last five. So that sets up all the storylines for this week. Manchester United ownership. A couple of different uh, talking points in and around that. Could QSI be interested, or is it Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos who would be getting the inside track about picking up Manchester City? Two points of view. First from the back pages tonight, folks at Sky Sports News, and then Kabe Salakal breaks it all down, once again, courtesy of our friends at Sky Sports. Uh, very much a conversation throughout the night and the morning. Qatari's uh, staggering swoop for United. Super rich investors to table offers within days. Glazers want £6 billion pounds and group confident bid will blow rivals away. And Ten Hag set for a huge transfer kitty. Charlie, what do you make of this? Would we have expected something similar to this to emerge? I certainly think it was a matter of time that, you know, that the billionaires, particularly from the Middle East, um, you know, increase their interest in the club. Of course, it's particularly interesting, um, the location of the country where these investors are from, because, of course, your first thoughts that is it Qatari sports investment that, of course, mm. um, you know, you, you know, have uh, you know ma massive uh, influence at you know PSG. So uh, I, I think they've got to prove that it's not them because obviously they wouldn't be able to play in the same competition. Um, but you know, it's it's going to be a huge deal that's needed to buy Manchester United, and of course, you know, six billion pounds being spoken about, and then they've got a stadium that is tired needs two billion, whether it's a new stadium or knocking down the main stand. So it's a massive rebuild. I think Manchester United fans would still prefer Jim Radcliffe, a billionaire, Manchester United fan, but it's, a, it's an interesting development. And I'm sure some other, uh, it will probably flush some other uh, wannabe uh, buyers as well. The situation is that uh, the Qataris feel that they put on the best ever uh, World Cup uh, in November and December last year and they want to capitalise on that. They want to build on what they see as a success of the World Cup. And one way of doing that is to buy a club in the Premier League or a stake in a club in the Premier League. Because the Premier League is obviously the biggest, most popular league in the world, and the Qataris want a piece of that. Now, the good news for them is that they are spoilt for choice at the moment because there's never been a time like this for anybody who wants to buy or invest in a Premier League club because Liverpool and Manchester United are effectively for sale and there are lots of other clubs who are looking for investment. Uh, so the Qataris want to buy or invest in a Premier League club. Uh, Liverpool, Manchester United uh, are two of their targets. They are considering uh, making a bid for a club. But I still think there is also the possibility that they may just buy a minority stake in a club uh, rather than buy a club outright. Would that be of interest to the Glazers then? What is the level of interest in Manchester United for them? Well, I think the Glazers would potentially be interested in somebody just investing in the club. Uh, it's well documented uh, that Manchester United need to redevelop Manchester United, they, uh, 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 Old Trafford. They also need to do some work on their training ground. That is all going to take money. Uh, so if you could get some outside investment, it would help with that. Uh, so they would be open to that. They're also open to selling the club outright. Now, the only issue with that is how much they think the club is worth. They think Manchester United is worth around £6 billion. Uh, but according to the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the club is worth closer to around uh, £3 billion. And regarding the point you made about the level of interest, uh, the sale of Manchester United or the uh, invitations to invest in the club is being marketed by Investment Bank in New York called the Rain Group. And if you want to buy or invest in Manchester United, uh, you need to make a bid by the middle of this month. Now, it's a bit of a different process to what we were used to uh, with Chelsea. There was a lot of interest around Chelsea. There was a lot of reports in the media about different bidders coming in. Uh, this time round, uh, it has been much more quiet and much more subdued. Uh, so there is interest out there in buying Manchester United, but I don't think it's at the level that we saw with Chelsea. Why is that? 
Well, I think with Chelsea, uh, it was such a massive story. Uh, you know, Roman Abramovich was forced to sell Chelsea. There was a deadline. It had to be done by the end of the month. There was a danger that the club was going to go out of business. The club shop was closed. Uh, you know, fans couldn't buy tickets. Uh, the government were involved. It all had to do with, uh, you know, started off with Russia invading Ukraine. So it was a massive global story and it attracted lots of people. You know, people like Conor McGregor apparently wanted to buy uh, Chelsea. There was the uh, uh, Nick Candy. There was so many different bids. There was the guy who owned a hotel in Turkey uh, who said that he wants to buy Chelsea. It attracted a lot of people who were serious about buying Chelsea, but a lot of people as well who were looking for publicity. I think that is what's different. As far as Manchester United and Liverpool are concerned, uh, it is not as much of a sort of media circus. But there is interest in buying Manchester United, but I'm being told that it's not quite at the level that was expected. Uh, so far, the only person who's shown their hand uh, has been the uh, UK businessman Sir Jim Ratcliffe uh, who's come out and said that yes he would like to buy Manchester United but apart from that uh, we haven't had anyone coming out publicly uh, saying that they want to buy the club in the same way as we had uh, with Chelsea. One of the other big storylines the investigation into Manchester City by the Premier League over a hundred violations over an eight-year period involving salaries Unreported monies that have been alleged. A lot of violations on the table. Once again, here's Kavi Salakal breaking it all down for you to try and explain it in about four minutes. My sense is that uh, many of the other Premier League clubs uh, would actually want uh, Manchester City to potentially be relegated if they were found guilty of all these charges uh, because these charges are um, unprecedented mm. and this is a very serious matter as far as they're concerned. Of course, Manchester City yesterday said they were very surprised that these charges had been brought and they've always insisted that they have done nothing wrong. Uh, but if the Independent Commission finds them guilty, uh, one of the most severe punishments that they can recommend to the Premier League board is expulsion from the Premier League. Uh, now, there's been lots of talks that maybe if they were found guilty, some of their titles from the past could be taken mm. away. Wouldn't the other teams want that because it might mean they got the title? Or? I don't think so. I think okay. my sense is that uh, there's always been a feeling in football that you don't really want to go back and change Premier League yeah. or any league tables from the past because um, that leads to a lot of confusion and basically it's meaningless because you've missed out on uh, winning the title in the past. You're not mm. going to get the ceremony to celebrate with your fans. So I don't sense there's much of an appetite for that. Uh, also, potentially, if they were found guilty, what about a fine? Again, I think, you know, Premier League clubs generally are, are so rich that, yeah. that fines don't really affect them. Uh, now, I've also been told that up to now, until yesterday, mm. uh, the clubs who'd been pushing hardest for these charges uh, to be brought were some of the other members of the so-called Big Six. Okay. Now, that's not surprising that Manchester City's rivals would be looking for any kind of advantage that they could uh, get. I've also been told, not surprisingly, if Manchester City were found guilty, there would not be much sympathy for them amongst the other Premier League clubs. Uh, but I have to stress, as far as the other Premier League clubs are concerned, they don't want to get involved in this. They don't want to interfere in the process it is all going to be dealt with uh, by an independent commission mm. which they have absolutely nothing to do with in terms of yesterday um you know you we got the sense certainly from vinnie who was outside the air that the city weren't happy the way that this was brought about that they, they felt it was kind of a, a shock announcement that they, they were still on the phone i believe whilst the the statement was made public um how did it kind of go out internally with the club with the rest of the, the staff and the players how are Look, they told? Uh, I think as far as Manchester City are concerned, they've uh, always said that they have done nothing wrong. Uh, they believe that these charges should never have been bought. Mm. That was their position all along with the UEFA investigation as well. Mm. I think as far as yesterday were concerned, you have to feel some uh, 
sympathy for the Premier League as well, because this is such a serious matter. Mm. Of course, they would want it to all be coordinated so that nobody knew about it before Manchester City were uh, informed. And my reading of events yesterday were, uh, was that the Premier League did everything by the book. Uh, you know, I believe couriers were sent to Manchester City's offices uh, with the paperwork. Mm. A phone call was made. Uh, the announcement was not brief to any journalists. The first anyone knew about it was when it appeared on the Premier League website. Right. But of course, I can understand why people at Manchester City uh, would feel uh, that, you know, other people have it in for them. And as we talked about yesterday, maybe uh, the players, Pep Guardiola, will develop a kind of siege mentality uh, as far as events and performance on the pitch are concerned. Maybe they'll come out fighting and feel, look, everyone's against us. Mm. Uh, let's show them what we're really all about. But you'd think that there was real uncertainty because if the players are only finding out about this kind of almost like a drip feed because, you know, like say that the, the phone call was made, it was on, it was a Premier League statement, they could have easily seen that before they'd almost spoken to the club. So that whole uncertainty of staff, of, of everyone that works in Manchester City, really hanging over them at the moment, something they really don't need in terms of them trying for a title at the moment. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, of course it could potentially uh, affect their performances. But in the past, Pep Guardiola ha has always said, uh, look, I speak to the people upstairs, I deal with them, yeah. leave that to me. Uh, and I also run the football side of the operation. The two separate things. I think he'll be concentrating on making sure that the players uh, just focus on matters on the pitch and nothing else. Newcastle, we mentioned them last time out of the blocks. They have they are unbeaten in 15 in a row. 10-10 and 1 on the year. 10 wins, 10 draws, 1 loss, and they have a goal difference of plus 22. The guys at Saturday Night Football discussed Newcastle and Eddie Howe right now being in the final European place in Champions League right now with 18 matches to go. Stuff for dream shows. Your is, form yeah. I mean, to be in the top four yeah. at this stage of the season, it's fantastic. What, I mean, they're they're, I mean, they're, they're probably team. beyond their expectations Absolutely. themselves. You know, the, the plan of the new owners came in, whatever, a year ago, whatever amount of months ago it is. And, and you know, they're, they're ahead of that. You know, they're probably two years ahead of schedule, realistically. You know, if they finished in the top six this year, would it, it would be an unbelievable yeah. season. So, in a sense, the pressure's off them a little bit. Um, but the there is that. There's the sense of what the expectations were at the start of the season. And then there's what the expectations were post-World Cup reset when mm. Newcastle come in. And fans now will be expecting... Well, you can see it today, couldn't you? We can hear, I know we're not court. there, but you can actually... It transmits to the viewer at home that yeah. they were a bit agitated. They weren't quite... Because they set such high standards and they want to see their team winning. Draws are coming into play. All of a sudden you start thinking, the top four, can we actually do it? Imagine Champions League nights again at, at Newcastle. I mean, remember many years ago when they were doing it. It was the brilliant nights for the whole club and the, and the city. So, but they are... They're going in the right way. Whatever happens this year, the manager, the club, the way they've structured all their buying, the recruitment has been top class. They've not wasted money. They've improved. Eddie Howe's improved players it had at his disposal that we never thought would be playing at this level. They're doing a great job. I just think it's important they keep going now because it's, a, it's certainly a club that top players from around the world are going to want to be going to all the time. I think as well, Jamie, it's just about managing that expectation, mm. you know, because the fans, they're coming every week now to St James. How do you do that, though, up there? I know, but they're, tough, they're, right, going, they're going to roll West Ham over. West Ham finished seventh last season. They, they have got a, even right. Eddie mentioned in his interview, West Ham have got some really good players in their team, you know, just because of the position they're in at the minute. It doesn't make them a bad team. They just had a poor first half to the season. So there's no easy games in the Premier League. And Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's, Eddie's interview after was really honest. And, and, you know, West Ham are a good team. And, and, and again, you know, next season there'll be more expectation on Newcastle. And Eddie's got to manage all that again. It's back down to the manager, the pressure on his shoulders, you know. But to be fourth in the league at this time of the season is just brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about managing expectations and at the same time harnessing that excitement and sort yeah. of using that to, to build upon as well. And it is still 16 games unbeaten, which is the second highest for any English manager in the Premier League. Frank Clark at the top with 25 games. I mean, that's, ast that's astonishing. I mean, what a, what a run that is in 95. Do you, Incredible. When you, when you look at an, an English manager performing as well as he, and this is for, for Jamie, obviously, Shay, <laughs> uh, performing as well as he is doing in the, in the Premier League, do you think that maybe the England job lies in Eddie Howe's, not near future, future yeah. but long-distance future? Well, of course, the FA will be looking at it. I mean, Gareth Southgate said he's going to take, you know, carry the job on at the moment, but Eddie Howe, he's just got that magic touch. He improves players that he's got. 
he's just done an amazing job. And all the signings they've made, they've made a lot. They've spent a lot of money in Newcastle since the new owners come in. I think he's been the best one. Because it, it probably wasn't that exciting at the time for the Newcastle fans. They might have wanted a big name. And Eddie's gone in there and, and just been so calm, so assured. Talks sense. He talks football. He doesn't try to baffle people with science. He just says as it is. And he's done an incredible job. And you can see right now, I mean... The, he, he wouldn't want to leave Newcastle. Why would you want to leave? The, he can achieve everything I'm he wants there. Him. Yes, you <laughs> are, Kelly. I think, uh, you, just I leave think alone, you are. You're, and he's happy in the words in my mouth. He's found there, living there. He's I happy. Did say yeah, exactly. in You're going to get me in trouble with the Newcastle fans now. Look, no, listen. He's. A, I'm sure he's. As ha- he probably was delighted to see Gareth Southgate keep that job because if he hadn't, yeah. the first. Port of call would certainly be. I think it was strongly help. linked with the one. Gareth Southgate was yeah. sort of him and high, wasn't he? And then I, I think that's why that's why Gareth went. Out. And then I think <laughs> no, no, I think I think Gareth went up at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did think then the Newcastle owners actually struck then and goes, "We'll give Eddie a new contract because how well he's done and, and, and tied him down to a longer deal or whatever." But he deserves that contract. When, you, when, when obviously you're, you're a Newcastle man, when he first come, would you? Would, 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 how well, you well it'd be interesting if you, had a, if you had a panel of Newcastle people or hundred people and you asked them, you know, would Eddie Howe be your number one choice at the time? I would say it would probably be fifty fifty. But if you ask them today and now, they wouldn't swap any, Eddie Howe for any manager in the world. And, and that's how good a job he's done. He, as you say, the recruitment, the, the, the results on the pitch, you know, everything has just been absolutely brilliant. You know? and, and, and now he's the manager to be there long term. You know, people said at the very start, oh, he'll be there for a year, get them safe, and then they'll bring in the big names. Yeah. But there's no Newcastle fan I've ever met on the streets or anything that would say they want to swap him for anybody. And that just shows the brilliant job he's done. Sorry, 17 matches to go. Now, getting into some of the coaches that we're going to be scratching our heads about. Liverpool right now, we mentioned them. They are in 10th place. They have lost three of four. Jurgen Klopp, after the embarrassing loss, 3-0 to Wolves. Here are his comments after the match, courtesy of our friends at Sky Sports. Jurgen, not the result you're after. How do you sum up today's work? Uh, yeah, obviously the, a horrible start. Two goals, which um, cannot happen like they happen but we all witnessed it it happened and we are two nil down for because for our own faults uh, mistakes because um, I think both goals we should have we should have defended better but it's a little bit uh, I think we were passive in that period we've been in the whole formation can't explain it no excuse, there's no excuse for it no explanation in a moment it's really not cannot happen like this but we all saw it it happened um, then it's you are tuning down crowd is there blah 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 but the game opens up we, we, we get a bit of control of the game have played good stuff so the second half then I, I think we played for around about 45 minutes a really good away game so first half and then start of the second half was really good without scoring so it was always clear it looked 100% like that even when we were, had a horrible start, if we score one goal, um, this can change completely. But it's a big if because we didn't. And that yeah, sums it up pretty much. Then bottom of the table, we mentioned Southampton. Nathan Jones losing 3-0 to Brentford. Before that, they lost 1-0 to Villa. They did get that one win, 2-1 to Everton that kind of uh, pushed Frank Lampard out the door. Then before that, 1-0 loss to Forest, 2-1 loss to Fulham. Nathan Jones taking responsibility after the whitewashing by the Bees. Nathan, a disappointing day. I'm sure. What's your reflection on the performance today? Look, really disappointed with the, with the performance. But look, take, I take full responsibility. You know, in, in terms of everything, we weren't weren't aggressive enough. And, and look, I, I've been recruited, as I've said in the previous interview. I, I've been recruited to be a really aggressive front-footed side, and I haven't delivered that yet. And I've I've, I've compromised a lot. I've pandered around a few things, and. And, and to be honest, with you, it's been to our detriment. So, so look, I take full responsibility for the performance today, for the for the way they've they've played. And uh, as I said, that won't happen again. Back to Liverpool quickly on Saturday mornings. If you get the chance to watch Sky Sports, you always get to see Jeff Stelling and Paul Merce, uh, Paul Merce, and go back and forth and uh, with their panels and everyone as they're watching all of the events happening live in the Premier League. So, Stelling asked Merce about Liverpool. And what he thought. Once again, courtesy of our friends at Sky Sports News. Well, well, what the heck happened today? Sounds like they were totally outclassed. They were. They were. They got off to a bad start. The first first twelve minutes, they're two 0 down. First of all, Matip tries to play <laughs> offside, and he's not offside. Uh, uh, Wang, and he sort of stops, and then when he goes to go and close him down, the ball comes in, it hits him, and goes in. It's an own goal, clear own goal. 
And then Dawson finishes, good header. Again, you know, poor defending in my opinion. Then after that, they did push. I watched them at Brighton, Jeff, and they got well beat. Here, I was sitting watching, I said to Clinton, if they score a goal here, they'll go on and get a result. You know, it was they were they would give a lot more than what they did at Brighton. But then on the counter attack, you know, they missed they scored a good goal with a with Neves, great touch by Neves, great play by Traore. And then Jimenez had another one. It could have been four. First time I've seen Klopp just sitting there like... <clears throat> like I, was, I don't like the word lost. He's not lost, but I don't think he knows what else to do now. I think, you know, he's watching this team and it is a million, million miles off of where they were last year. A million miles off. Um, it, it's early in the calendar year, I know. But in a league table based on this calendar year, Liverpool will be bottom wow. of the Premier League. Um, do, you, do you think that? Um, do you think he, it's guesswork? Of course. Do you think he might be thinking, "I can't do any more at this club"? I think he'll wait till the Champions League. I think he'll wait till after the Real Madrid game. I think, you know, if he gets a couple of players fit, you know, I think if he gets a Van Dijk fit, you know, and then all of a sudden. You know, it's a different game if they go and beat Real Madrid over two legs. Watching this, I don't see him doing that. But with Van Dijk back, you know, Matip and Gomez don't look the same players without a, a Van Dijk next to them. The two full-backs have, have lost their way. The midfield's just getting overrun. And up front, Nunes touches the ball more times than anyone, but just can't hit the target and score a goal. So Salah looks... I mean, he looks a million miles off Salah. You know... That, as I said before to show you, you're talking about players that were consistently at eight at nine last season. They're consistently at six and fives now. I mean, and when you go, when you dip that much, I don't see how you get results in this league. It's ruthless. So that's your rundown of the news of the week. Your next match is on the board, and we'll give you your early juice boxes here. On the weekend, it is the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th, because once again, you've got makeup games that happen in short order in the midweek next week as well. So we're going to focus on the uh, 11th and the 12th and the 13th before the games next Wednesday kick back in. We have that one makeup game, Arsenal-Manchester City. That one is at the Emirates, and we'll keep an eye on that one as an early match of the week. So on Saturday, 7.30 in the morning, West Ham and Chelsea. Chelsea on the road is a plus 127. 10 o'clock matches, there are five. Arsenal minus 244 at home hosting Brentford. What did they do with that big match with Manchester City coming up in the midweek? Crystal Palace hosting Brighton. Deserby squad, the Seagulls are a plus 104. Crystal Palace a plus 279. Your draws a plus 250. Fulham hosting Forest at Craven Cottage. They're a minus 108. Draws a plus 261. Forest is north of plus 315. Leicester and Spurs. Spurs are a plus 114, your draw is a plus 262, and Leicester is a plus 243. Southampton and Wolves, interesting match at the bottom of the table. Southampton right now a plus 196, your draw is a plus 219, and Wolves are a plus 160. Your late game on Saturday, interesting one from the Vitality. Bournemouth, a plus 550, your draw is a plus 317, and Newcastle is a minus 182 on the road. Sunday, Leeds hosting Manchester United again. Leeds, a plus 304 after uh, the 2-2 draw in the midweek. Your draw is a plus 290. Manchester United on the return fixture at Ellen Road is a minus 115. Then at 1130 on Sunday morning, Manchester City hosting Aston Villa. It is a City at a minus 400. Draws a plus 483. Villa basically a plus 1,100 on the board. Monday night football, Liverpool hosting Everton Merseyside. Derby, you know that Everton fans would take a point right now and run. Liverpool a minus 185. Your draw is a plus 342. And Everton is a plus 523. That's your rundown of everything that has gone on or is going to go on in the next week of life in the Premier League with the January transfer window closed. We'll see what happens as we continue to go forward with the three groups that we have in the Premier League. For everybody here at SDH, for Jason, for Jarrett, for Nick, I'm just John. Played safe, everybody. Enjoy your time with the Prem 
and your favorite teams. That's another round of Prem and Proper Played Safe, everybody. We'll catch up with you next time. 